Good morning, church. <laughs> Praise God. Does anybody know what Psalm chapter 1 verse 1 says? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the, nor sits with the seed of the scornful. Blessed is the man who doesn't do those things. Why? Well, that's what he does do. But why is he blessed if he doesn't do those things? No, no, no. Wow, did you hear that? It was very abrupt. Because he'll be cursed when he does. It's funny how we can just read scriptures and recite them and not actually understand what they're saying. It's saying, blessed is the man. What's the opposite of blessing? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. It's incredible because if we do those things, the blessing is no longer there and we end up exposing ourselves to the curse. And guess what so, so, so many people who go to church and say they believe in God do? They spend all their time with the ungodly, with sinners and scorners. And they wonder why their life is a mess. <clears throat> when the word of God says, blessed is the man who doesn't do those things, it means it. So who here wants to walk a blessed life? Well then, don't do those things. That's not rocket science, is it? That's just so simple. The word of God is so simple yet pro so profound. Uh, the starting place matters. Our point of reference matters. We think that we're such independent thinkers. We think that we're independent people. Do we have independent people here today? You think you're your own man or your own woman and no one's going to tell me what to do? That's deception. We think that we're that type of people. I want to tell you today, our tastes, our desires, our goals are shaped by the society that we live in. Your taste of fashion is shaped by the marketing you get exposed to and you don't even know you're being exposed to it. Did you know that? If we were living in the 70s now, a lot of us sitting in this room would feel very uncomfortable and next week we would dress differently. True? Because our tastes and our desires are shaped by the society that we live in, the messaging that we receive. I remember when we were driving through the back streets of Mumbai, and I remember looking out the window from this bus, if you could call it that, um, and just on the sidewalk, the pavement, the nature strip, whatever you want to call it, were these, I don't think you could call them houses, but it was their homes, and it was like a terrace set up, so... Everyone was, the, the wall was for the house on the left and the house on the right. They were all joined together, two levels. And these homes were made out of leftover material. They weren't brick homes. They looked more like, put it this way, very few Australians would have them in their backyard as a shed. It was bits of metal, bits of wood, cardboard, material, etc. And as we were driving so close, because they were right on the side of the street, you could literally see straight in through the front entrance because there wasn't a door there, it was just a piece of material. And there were people inside sleeping. And these rooms were so small that as I looked in, I actually saw them laying over each other. There was no space in there. They were literally laying side by side, and some of them had their legs over the other people. I thought, wow, could you imagine us doing that in Australia? There'd be a fight in a moment. Get your leg off me. All you have to do is get your kids in the back of the car, isn't it? Stop touching me. But I looked at that and I thought, wow, what a way to live life. It's, it's a real eye-opener. It's a culture shock when you look at that type of thing. If you went to one of those young people, one of those children, and gifted them with a new pair of cheap shoes that were perhaps even too big for them, they would take hold of that with such joy and excitement like they've just won the lottery. You could get a relatively decent pair of shoes in some families in the West and present them to a same age child and they would look at it with disdain and disgust because it's not a brand name. True? What is your starting place? What is your point of reference? We've got to understand how 
We are influenced and how our thinking is shaped by the society we live in. In Mumbai, their starting place was a place of poverty, of having nothing. Their point of reference was probably having no shoes or finding shoes on a dump heap that's got holes in them. And so their response would be totally different. I remember when we were up in Foray, when we went up for the extension of the clinic, not the recent trip, but the one before that. And I got on, a, there's a bit of a field there, and I got out there and started playing chasing games with the kids. And they were elated. They were screaming, they were laughing. You could see happiness coming out of their eyes, their face and everything. They probably thought it was funny, a white man running around with them. But they didn't catch me because that was seven years ago and my hammies never used to get pulled then. They couldn't keep up. But the joy they get out of such simple things is incredible. My, little, my two youngest at the time, uh, I remember them, both of them at separate times went to, to Linda and they said, they wear the same clothes every day and they're dirty and they got holes. Can we give our clothes to them? And when they get one piece of clothing, they are happier than when someone in the West gets a two, three hundred dollar present. And we've got to understand this in our life. In the West, our starting place and points of reference is what we see in the media, the peer pressure that we're exposed to. What we're taught in society is successful. We're consumed with our appearance, with our presentation and how we look. Those guys in Mumbai are consumed with survival. It's interesting to note Someone might do a bit of research for me. I would say that we have far more mental health problems in the West where we've had more than society's ever had in the history of humanity available to us than what people in places where they're surviving from day to day have. You've got to stop and think, what's going on in our society and am I being touched by it? We have so many expectations in the West placed on us by society, the world system. And then we start to buckle under those expectations and mental health issues go through the roof. We are dominantly shaped and formed by imperfect families. Anybody here brought up in a perfect family? I'm trying to find where my children are. <laughs> Didn't see any hands go up. Imperfect upbringing, yes. Broken corrupt society, an education system today which is hijacked by indoctrination and it's ungodly and it's wicked, it's perverse and it's evil. And now for the first time in the history of humanity, a thing called social media, 6,000 years of human history and we come across this thing called social media and it has power and potential to destroy individual lives, marriages, families, Western civilization itself. Pastor Shady was telling me this guy at the place he was working there at math came up and was just confiding in him. And he said, you know, I used to wake up every single morning and reach for my Bible and read the word of God. He said, I haven't done that in ages. He says, now I reach for the iPad and I go on to Facebook to see the notifications. And he says, before... I realize it, I've got to put it down and run so I'm not late for work. It's insidious. And yet society has been so impacted by it and not realizing it. I, I've, I've reflected as I've looked at some marriages and you see what once used to be a family unit where people would interact with each other, that all of a sudden the husband's on his little device and he's in his social media world. And the wife's on her little device and she's in her social media world. And they've got different friends and connections and different feedback coming from different people. And all of a sudden there's an isolation taking place without them even realizing it. Why am I sharing this this morning? Because we are living in perilous times. And as Christians we've got to wake up to what's influencing us and what's impacting our lives. There are literally marriages that are being destroyed because of social media. And that's not an exaggeration. Every day, every single one of us, we're being influenced and we're being changed and we're being shaped and moulded by what we allow to touch our lives. 
I'll give some examples of how the media manipulates society. And guess who's behind media? It's obvious. Demonic powers. If you look at the issue of Israel and Gaza, it's astounding the amount of attention this conflict gets. And while we acknowledge that every death, especially when it's civilians, is sickening and horrific, and we need to acknowledge that as Christians, life is precious, God creates life, we value life no matter who it is. And the reports that are out there of how many people have died, 10,000, 12,000, whatever the numbers are, it keeps going up all the time. But it's amazing the media blitz that has hit the airwaves, the number of protests globally, the reactions, families divided, and it eclipses the estimates of the hundreds of thousands that have been killed in Ukraine. You just think about it for a moment. If you're touching the news or if you're on social media, Israel, Gaza, Israel, Gaza, protests, um, there's, there's ructions around the world. It's consuming the time and attention of millions of people. And then you look at the comparison between 10, 15,000 dead, and I'm not undermining that, but if you look at the comparison of that to a nation where they say there's hundreds of thousands, and so few, there were people reacting, but the comparison is quite startling. Why? Because we are being manipulated and played. If we were rational beings, we'd be reacting more of the hundreds of thousands or in the same way. Hundreds of thousands injured over there and hundreds of thousands killed. Did you know someone told me last week that two million Afghanistani refugees have been ordered out of Pakistan? Did anybody know that? I was told last week. Can you imagine they went in, I saw some video footage where the, the government came in with bulldozers and just started going through the whole area, just smashing all of the houses down and ordered them out of the country. These people are just literally on foot walking back into an Afghanistani winter. They said there's hardly any food, they're running out of water and disease has set in. And have you heard of that on the news? Do you know why you haven't heard about it? Because the media will tell us what we want to hear, what they can inflame, where they can cause division and dissension and manipulate the masses. Remember who's behind the media. I was astounded when I looked at that. Sudan last month, 9,000 deaths, 5.6 million people displaced. Kicked out of their homes, travelling, trying to find a camp somewhere to survive from day to day. These things are going on around the world. Geneva Academy reports currently, they look on humanitarian affairs around the world, globally. They said there's 110 armed conflicts around the world. I didn't know that. And some of them are significant. The moral outrage we see on social media platforms on specific issues and a deafening silence on others is nothing short of astounding. We live in such a media-manipulated society that there's more outrage today on the evils of slavery from 150 to 200 years ago. Anybody seen that? Especially if you get into the Western world and the universities, you see it all over America and England, they want to rip down statues, do all sorts of things. And we agree slavery is evil. But it's astounding to think that the estimates are that there are 50 million people enslaved today. Slaves are still being bought and sold today, 50 million. How many people here knew that? that what's the population of Australia? 25, 27, whatever, 50 million. And you don't hear any outrage about it. Why? Because Satan's not in the business of getting rid of evil. He just wants to stir up dissension and influence and consume people's minds with politics and debating. I, when I looked at that, I was like, wow. 50, I knew there was slavery. I had no idea it was a, an estimated 50 million. The astounding manipulation globally. This is a big one. I might upset some of you here. When it came to COVID, it was a mass manipulation of 
the whole globe almost. It was incredible. We should have been astounded by that. And what it should do is make us alert as Christians as we move forward in these perilous times before the second coming of Jesus is to not be deceived, to not be taken up, to not be distracted, to not be consumed by what the enemy brings our way. I was asked by a cardiologist to go and get my heart checked because I had COVID pretty bad. It was the Delta variant at the beginning. And he wanted to check to see if there was peri or myocarditis. That's the swelling of the muscles around the heart that you can die from. And while I was getting checked, this nurse that was doing, is it the ultrasound or whatever it is that they run over your body checking? And I asked her a question. I said, have you had many people who had COVID? Because they were checking them all, all of the patients who got peri or myocarditis. She said, not one, but we've had lots from the vaccine. And you just don't hear about it. It's covered up, it's smothered. And we need wisdom and discernment as Christians as we go forward in these matters. Here's a little tip of wisdom for you. Just think about this for a moment. When you are not allowed to speak about a certain subject, more importantly, when you can't question it, and if you do question it, you're attacked and demonized, you know that there's some power at work. You'll notice that there's certain subjects that you are not allowed to speak against. Don't you dare speak and say, I believe marriage is between a man or a woman. You will be cancelled, you will be silenced, you will be um, demonized. And it's amazing as we face each of these things that come up, there's like a, other people can say what they want from their side, but the moment you speak up, you're attacked, you're a bigot, you're this, that and the other. It's manipulation. The spiritual forces at work. And as a church, we need to be aware of it. Forces that want to control. Do you know who's in the controlling business? Satan is. Do you know who's in the liberating business? God. God doesn't come along and control you. He tells you to humble yourself. You do it voluntarily. He says, draw near to me. Satan drives. He controls. He manipulates. He intimidates. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. We forget that. We think people just hear the gospel and if they're a good person and they're pretty smart, they'll make the right decision and do the right thing. No, no. The Bible says that their minds are blinded by the God of this world. Who's the God of this world? He blinds people's minds. And you should be sitting there this morning and think, has my mind ever been blinded by the devil? Don't just go, oh, he does it to the people in the world. No, we are in the world. So the question should be, am I being manipulated? Has my mind been blinded in some way? Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Blinding the minds, the God of this world is active. And we need to challenge ourselves. Ephesians 2, 2. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world. There's no independent people in this world. You're not your own man. You think you are, but you're just picking stuff up you've heard from elsewhere, taking ownership of it, and you think that's you. It's been fed into you. You're walking according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. Do you know, I find that really like frightening to think that these demonic beings can come and indwell someone and work in them to produce blindness and disobedience and slavery and captivity and torment. I don't want that in my life. I love the scripture that says, whom the sun sets free is free indeed. But it amazes me how many Christians get manipulated and lulled by satanic forces without even realizing it. We need to rebuke and resist the enemy. We preached on that a couple of weeks ago. Humble yourself under the mighty arm of God and resist the devil. The prince of the power of the air, there are influences, strong, deceptive influences, tremendous spiritual activity behind what we see happening in society. 
The purpose of drawing our attention to these matters is not this morning to prove who's right or wrong on Israel or Gaza. That's not my purpose on slavery, on COVID or any of those other things, the gift of the shoes. It's not to bring your attention to that, but to an understanding that we are men and women who are going to be influenced one way or another. You're, you're going to be influenced one way or another. You can't be neutral. There's no such thing. And we need to be aware of that. Daily we are exposed to influences in our lives that are changing us, that can end up setting us free or they can drive us and demoralize us and bring us into bondage. Did you know music and art are incredibly powerful mediums? Are you aware of that? That the spiritual realm can move through those expressions. Very powerful. Very, very powerful. Some people profess to be Christians and they listen to music that is inspired by the enemy. They are literally sitting there saturating themselves in music that is being motivi- motivated, created, inspired by demonic spirits. And you can generally pick it up very quick if you're a man or a woman of the spirit. It agitates you. It's, it's not harmonious. It's disjointed. It's rough. It's, and if anything, it stirs up these emotions in you that are anything but godly. And it's real and it's true. And I want to tell you today, be careful what you're listening to. As a Christian, you should know. Put on a worship song that's truly worshipping God. Pray in the Spirit and then try and listen to one of those songs afterwards and you will see they don't go together. It's obvious. So many people are opening themselves to the demonic through the music they listen to. If you love music, get worship music. And I'm talking about real worship music. I remember praying for somebody once who was experiencing horrific demonic manifestations and I began to hone in on their involvement in music and they were in the music industry. And as I began to hone in in that area in prayer, all of a sudden this voice began to speak out of this person saying, he's mine, he works for me. I was quite taken back by that. I hadn't heard that before. Involved in that music industry, a person who was putting it out to others. And this horrible spirit spoke through them and said, he's mine, he works for me. And you know when it's a person putting on a funny voice and when it's a demon, let me tell you that. Walking according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Remember these spirits are sick, perverse and evil. It's got nothing to do with, oh, I like that type of music. You need to be set free. Satan will always come and make it look nice to us to tempt us. If there's no temptation, we wouldn't fall to it. So he makes it appealing to us. But inside of it, it's evil, it's perverse, and it will kill, steal, and destroy you. Who wants to open themselves up to that just so they can have what they want in the flesh? Challenging. I remember back in the 90s, there was a band, a metal band. I think they call it a metal band called Striper. Anybody remember Striper? And I remember arguments coming out in the church and people saying, oh, it's good, it's good. You know, they're singing Christian lyrics. It's a good Christian band. And I used to listen to them and I just thought, how can you sit comfortably with this? This is not the Holy Spirit. Oh, no, you just don't like that type of... No, it's not you don't like that type of music. I remember a couple of decades later, I was talking to Linda about this and her cousin in America used to play with them. He would do, what are they, the jamming. And he said, when they came out on stage, it would be Christian lyrics, reading scriptures, etc. And the cousin said, but behind closed doors, they were living like devils, including drugs and everything else. Why does the church not discern it? You should know straight away that there's a wrong spirit behind that. So don't get entertained by it and don't open yourself up to it. Because the longer you do it, the more in darkness and the more bound you become. It doesn't matter if they say, I'm a Christian band because I say Christian words. Satan used a scripture when he tried to tempt Jesus. We need more discernment than that. Amen? When the Holy Spirit dwells in you, there's a reaction, a confrontation in you when you're exposed to art. The same thing with art. Art is an expression of what's inside of people. 
And if there's demonic strongholds inside of people, it will come out in the art. You look at certain art. I remember my mum telling me when she did some training with the mental health, um, when she was doing nursing, and they went to this gallery, and this lady that was in that um, area of work for decades, she said, that picture, that picture, that picture, they're uh, drawn by people with mental health problems. And she explained, you just look at it and you can see the depression, the oppression, whatever it is. It's a medium that the enemy works through. We are children of the light. And so that which is of the Holy Spirit should come through in everything we do and say and that which we feed on. We want to make sure it's coming from the Spirit of God. Can you say amen amen to that? And not... Only music and art are entertainment and who we fellowship with. The word of God categorically says that light cannot fellowship with darkness. You don't do it. Do you speak to people when you go to work? Yes. You go out to a lunch with them during work hours? Yes. And you shine as a light, but you don't fellowship with them. Because the moment you do, you're coming against God's word that says, Blessed is the man who does not walk with does not stand with and does not sit with. And what happens is our conscience gets seared. And all of a sudden, what used to be something, well, I shouldn't have done that, you all of a sudden think, oh, it's not too bad. And then you're comfortable with it. The way to look at it is like this. You get a rotten apple and drop it in a barrel of apples. Those good apples in the barrel do not make the rotten apple good. The rottenness starts to seep into the other apples. If you go and have fellowship with darkness, if you feed on these things through social media, etc., etc., it's going to have a negative influence on you. That's why the Bible says, blessed is the man who doesn't do those things. Amen? What are you exposing yourself to? The Word of God teaches us, separate yourself from the world. You wonder why you're up and down and on a roller coaster It's because you're being driven by the spirit of this age when you keep feeding on this garbage. So what is your starting place? What is your point of reference? For you men, what does it mean to be a man? What is your starting place? What is your reference point? You could say, well, it's my dad. My dad taught me to be good with money. Or my dad taught me to be tough. How many of you here, your dad taught you to be tough? So in your mind, you think a real man is a tough man. Yes? Some dads teach their children to hate men by the way they treat them. But today, social media is teaching men how to be men. Or YouTube celebrities. It's amazing how many men have turned to Jordan Peterson and Andrew Tate. Those guys that have come on the scene of social media and they start teaching what it is to be a real man. Islam offers the same thing. And you have men looking and searching for true manhood, for the meaning of being a man. And guess what? When you get onto these social media, guys, it's the blind leading the blind. Does anyone beg to differ? Why would you go to someone who's unregenerate, who's blinded by the God of this world, and then be influenced by what they're saying? One of the things that Tate likes to say is a man should protect his woman. I don't need some unregenerate man in need of salvation who's turned to Islam to tell me I need to protect my wife. I don't need it. As a godly man, it's something that I believe that just comes by instinct. I don't need the world to tell me that. I don't need to look at them and go, yeah, that's right. I don't need that type of thing because I feed on the word of God and it's a much higher plane. Looking, searching for true manhood, the blind leading the blind. They're spiritually empty, those guys. Some people say, oh, I think Jordan Peterson's a Christian. He's not. He's a tormented man. If you truly look at him, he's a... Do you know one of the amazing things about him? His incredible intellect. He's discovered something called original sin. Because for years and years he studied how mankind, mankind could be so evil with all of the millions of people killed in Russia, in Siberian camps, and the Nazis, and what have you. And he's discovered that there's something in man, this potential for evil. It's like, yes, I could have told you that from one scripture. 
But it took him a few decades to work it out. But he still hasn't found Jesus Christ as his Lord and Saviour. Is he smart? Yes. Does he say things that are true? Yes. But you don't turn to someone who's in need of salvation and is still searching himself. Amen? If your starting place, your point of reference is anything other than God your Creator, God your Redeemer, the Word of God, you are lost, you are undone, you are being manipulated. You're a poor, wretched fool. Psalm 119, verse 130. I love this scripture. The entrance of your words, they give light. They give understanding unto the simple. You don't have to be an intellect. You don't have to be a man that's got degrees or anything like that. You can be. You can be a a poorly apostle who was a genius. Or you can be a simple worker that's never had an education Open the word of God. And when that word gets entrance into your life, it will bring light, it will bring understanding, and you'll no longer get tormented by the unrealistic expectations of what the media thrusts on us in the Western world. You'll begin to say, no, this is what God's word says. I'm not getting deceived by that. Do you know there's people that have got so much money they could retire the rest of their life and they're still worried that they haven't got enough. And you open the word and it says, give us this day our daily bread. God is faithful. Take no fault for tomorrow. The world system and the word of God, which one's going to have entrance to your life? Which one is controlling our thinking? Because we're all influenced by it, whether we like it or not. Until the word of God supersedes and drives out the lies and deceptions and allows light and understanding into my life. If you want to live a strong, victorious life, There is only one way to do it, and that is to open your Bible and allow the Word of God to have entrance to your life. Hallelujah. There's no other way about it. If you took, I would say, probably, most people who are on social media, if you took 10% of the time you spent on social media in the Word of God, your life will begin to change. But guess what? We're addicted without knowing it. That guy that came to Pastor Shady said, it's become a problem. I just, every morning I've got to check. It becomes an addiction. You've got to stand against it, church. Start opening the word of God. Be who God's called us to be. Only God's word gives true light. Only God's word gives true understanding. But notice it's the entrance of it into our life. When and how... Is God's word gaining entrance into your life? If it's once a week on a Sunday morning where you go, that was a good message or it was so-so, you are lost. You're in a bad place. We're here to bring alive the word of God and to stir each other up. You must have a daily relationship with God in his word and in prayer. And I want to tell you, times I don't believe are going to get easier for us. I believe the last days, the word of God says, there will be perilous times. Men will be lovers of self. Do you realize you start loving yourself without realizing you're loving yourself? Because the media shows you that these are the right shoes to wear. This is the right physique to have. This is the right look to have. And all of a sudden, I'm more consumed with my appearance. And you say, no big deal. I, I want to look good. No, no, no. It's not that you're looking good. It's that you have come under a manipulative spirit that is now controlling your life. Break it. Rebuke it. Find out what God's calling you to be. He calls you to be a real man and you'll only find out in Christ Jesus as you open the Gospels and the Word of God. If you hear Jordan Peterson or Andrew Tate, pray for their salvation and say, Lord, have mercy on them. Praise God if they're challenging some of the mad and lefty business that's out there in the world. But at the end of the day, they're both dead. Both groups. We don't want to preach left, right. We want to preach the kingdom of God. Amen. One of the greatest weaknesses of the church today, and therefore failings, is that we don't know God. God's not our starting place. And he's not our reference point. We, we truly, in, I'm talking generalization now in the church, people who are Christians, they don't know God. 
They want to go to a conference and know how to have revival, how to have healings, or how to have this, that, and the other. And I love all of those things. But they really don't want to know God. Because when you begin to know God, you go, I can't go into that place. When you begin to know God, you go, I'm not going to start giving my life to get hold of stuff that is corruptible and passing away. When you really know God, you have a fear of God, a reverential fear. Can you say amen to that? John 17 verse 3 says, This is life eternal. Let it get into your heart today. This is life eternal. Make sure you've got a house and an investment property. You wear good clothes. You're secure for your future. Your body's healthy. You're looking good. And society's looking at you and going, Wow, aren't they strong, smart, or rich? Church, this is driving the Western culture at the moment and we don't even realize it. We're caught up in it and it consumes us. Jesus says, this is life eternal. Did you hear those words? We're talking about eternity here. This is life eternal that they may know thee. He's talking about God the Father and the the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is everything, church. Once you have life eternal, nothing else in comparison matters. I'd rather be living in a shoebox in Mumbai and know the King of Kings and have life eternal than to be in a mansion in the West and be in darkness. Get it into your spirit today. Stop allowing the world to govern your life. Stop allowing the flesh to govern your life and say, God, by your grace, I'm going to open your word. I want to know you. I want to know your presence. I want to know your deliverance. You've come to give me life and life more abundantly. The enemy gives me all of this other stuff and he destroys me in the process. I don't want to be destroyed. I want the life of God. Hallelujah. To know God, to know Jesus Christ is to have life. If you think you're missing something in life because you haven't got what the world says you should have, I want to tell you today, have you got Jesus? Because if you do, and it's more than just a head thing, you won't be disappointed in the things you don't have. You'll be like, Jesus, be thou my vision. Hallelujah. And when you're in the hands of God, what can life throw at you that you need to worry about? Because if God's got you, it's all been settled. Hallelujah. You don't need to be or do what the world is calling you to be or do. Hear that in your spirit, man, today. You don't need to be or do what the world is calling you to be or do. All that the world has to offer, it will prove itself in the end. Vain, empty, void, desolate. It's corruptible and passing away. Job one twenty one says it, and say, and I and Job said, "Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return." The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. To have Jesus Christ is to have life, is to know life. And I want to tell you, church, as I finish up, Jesus is coming back soon. We need to hear it more often. I think Jesus is coming back soon. The time is drawing closer and closer. I don't know how many prophecies you can show me in the Word of God that haven't yet been fulfilled. You'd be hard-pressed to go find them. Prophecy after prophecy has been fulfilled. We are closer and closer to the second coming of Jesus. The days are dark. They're perilous. The Word of God says, Jesus warns us, trim your lamp. Make sure it's full of oil. How do you get your lamp full of oil? You ain't going to get it full of oil in the world. You're going to get it full of oil as you come into the presence of God and you're filled with the Spirit and go on being filled with the Spirit. Make that your objective in life. Hallelujah. Let's stand this morning.